Martin, we're recording. Great to uh, great to hang out with you, man. Hi, Daniel. Nice to see you, and thanks for the invitation. It's, it's an honor to be here for, with you. No problem. Always, <laughs> always great to hang out with Bitcoiners. I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I can't believe I get to do this like four or five times a week. Just sit down <laughs> and have chats with Bitcoiners and record it and then release it on a podcast and let the plebs get as much uh, value out of it as, as I do as well. So thank you for giving up the time. Thanks for, um, obviously... BTC Prague, huge event last year, very successful. Actually, the biggest Bitcoin event in Europe. <laughs> yes, counter, yes, I would say. Counter yeah. <laughs> to any other claims out there, uh, it was um, yeah, well done. And I'm really looking forward to to seeing what you guys are bringing to the table this year. And we will talk about that uh, towards the end of the show. But as we discussed, uh, myself, you, and uh, your brother Matthias, we wanted to get kind of like um a backstory about why why prague why why the czech republic what where did all of this history come from why is there such a rich vein of freedom thinking individuals there and why has bitcoin taken a hold over the the country and you know spreading its uh, orange glow so i'm looking forward to learning a little <laughs> bit about the the czech history here um so Take it back as far as you want to go, because you know, <laughs> there's many listeners from all over the world that might not have any idea of of where, well, before it was Czechoslovakia, uh, you know, that there's all of that story in there too. So wh where do you want to begin, mate? Uh, yeah, thank you, Daniel, for the introduction and thank you for kind words kind words regarding BTC Prague. I'm biased, so I'm not the right one to, to say it. So thank you. I follow. And uh yeah, and actually, you know, it, it's a uh, it's a story that I was wondering why Czechs are so strong and so heavily and deeply driven into the Bitcoin development from its beginning. So I thought about it a lot, actually, and it, it required us to do some research. But I realized that our it goes tightly and closely with our history of free uh, of uh, freedom fighting, which started already like six hundred years ago, and. Uh, it's actually quite interesting that, uh, and even Czechs are not aware of the fact that, you know, we can be even proud of uh, other things than the beer and maybe the hockey is, you know, and of course it's a Bitcoin, but nobody really, uh, nobody really knows, which is a bit pity, but we are early. So, but maybe to give uh, everyone a few, uh, few informations regarding this, and I don't definitely want to give you like a lesson of the history, but I believe that putting some facts into the context would uh, answer your question and explain why Czechs and why Bitcoin is so strong here regarding our, our favorite orange, uh, orange color. So um, just basically, we were always freedom fighters. Yeah, we gained our freedom here uh, in the middle of the Europe. And, and we still need to know the fact that we are Czech Republic, like small country in the middle of the Europe a really small one 10 million inhabitants so we probably never gonna be like 100 percent free it's about the decision if we're gonna be part of the western or the eastern bloc but we fought for it many many times in in our history and uh, we gained the freedom and lost it again and there are like few interesting moments in our history and the first one happened already in the 15th century actually when um like plebs took the officials uh, and throw them out of the town hall window in the in the city of Prague. It, it's called like defenestration of Prague in 15th century. And that actually marked uh, an early struggle for our religious and civil liberty, you know. And uh, I don't know if, if, if it became some kind of our local hobby, but it happened again 200 years after when plebeians again throw uh, the officials. They were like... Uh, Habsburg monarchy uh, members sitting in our Prague castle. So they threw through of them out of the windows again in 17th century. That actually escalated into the war with them. So I, I'm, I'm not really like saying that it was the positive, but again, it was just a symbol of our uh, willingness to be free here. And uh, again, like 200 years later in 19th century, uh, we emphasized uh, of Czech language and our identity, and that ended in our first revolution here in 1848, when finally Prague gained its independence from German monarchy. And 
we had like some bright, bright 60 years after and after World War One, Czechoslovakia was finally officially established where did, that goes with the collapse of uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. But uh, as probably everybody remembers, then World War Two happened. So we were fully occupied by Nazis again, lost a significant part of our land and basically had to strive again. Uh, and as you know, as history likes to rhyme or repeat itself, so we finally thought that we are free and that we gained some kind of freedom after World War II, but not for long again, because in 1948, uh, we officially became uh, by political patch, uh, part of a Soviet Union Communist Party, which lasted for another 20 years when even Soviet Union troops invaded our country with, uh, with an armed force and for basically forced us to live uh, under their oppressive and very brutal communist regime for another 20, 21 years. So um, it's actually quite interesting that nobody teaches us about this uh, in the history classes, you know, and, and because it's probably still like painful for the teachers. I don't know. Maybe we can elaborate on this yeah, uh, yeah, briefly yeah. too. That That's really interesting. So you, you went through the Czech uh schooling system i'm assuming state school yeah yeah most of my history is closely tied with czech schooling system yes and they don't teach you about that period like uh under communist rule that's that's just kind of brushed over yeah not, not really actually and that's that's quite interesting that you know uh yeah, we were taught a lot of about like, uh, let's say, uh, Greek philosophers. So I know that it's Diogenes who lived in the barrel, you know, which is great. But come on, I believe that like knowing more about the communism era, about the impact on our society um, and understanding how painful that period of time was actually for, for ourselves, for our nation, would uh, allow us to like understand... Um, nowadays situation in the world in in much like reasonable details but yes nobody really thought about this uh us on the primary school we've ended with world war ii and then i went to the secondary school when the history is not was wasn't really part of uh of the system anymore and this is actually quite pity and i don't know if it goes you know with uh, teachers who were still feeling feeling like that pain in their heart a lot of them were absolutely like part of the communist party they basically had no other chance if they wanted to be teachers and have a job and work efficiently and proficiently they had to be party of the uh, part of the communist party so i i, I have no 100 percent right answer for this so this is only only what i know from my parents and from my grandparents who were willing to share something so i can understand how bad all of this stuff was really was, but it goes, it, it continues, you know, even like, young, like younger generations who are attending primary schools are not really taught about uh, communist and, uh, and how, how bad that system basically it's, you know, it's not about the communism itself, but uh, so, yeah, okay. I, I would repeat so, myself. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm just whizzing through Wikipedia here and I'm just trying to get some dates. Uh, so the Czechoslovak, Czechoslovak Socialist Republic, it says um, 1948 to 1989. Yes. yes. Right. Okay. So that, so your parents must have, when were you born? Yeah, I was born in 1984. So, you know, I, I still, I still actually remember at least something and it's, yeah, maybe maybe let me like uh, give you some examples of uh, how how weird those days actually really were. You know, as mm. one of my grandfathers, uh, he was a dissident, so he wasn't like really allowed to have like a really privileged or nice job back then. Even my mother and my uncle, her brother, weren't allowed to actually uh, choose a school they would like to go for the secondary school. And again, for the university on one hand, but on the other hand, actually my second grandfather, he was a dean on the university here on the, in the city of Ostrava. So he was kind of a privileged, but of course he had to be a part of the communist party to be able to work in such a prominent position. 
and uh, he wasn't really happy about it, but that was a price that had to be paid so he can continue and focus on his work as he worked on uh, nuclear reactors and space program back then in uh, in 60s and 70s. Um, and th that's actually the point where the interesting story starts, that uh, as he traveled a lot around the world, he spoke five languages. He always, when he traveled, he had to apply and got the stamp from the officials that he can actually leave the country. And for the purpose of his travel, he got some foreign currency, depending on the country where he was going. Uh, to buy a dinner or accommodation or whatever. But, you know, as soon as he came back to Czech Republic after the trip, he had to return all of the unspent currencies because Czechs weren't uh, allowed to keep any foreign currencies, maybe not to think to run across the border west, you know. So he had to give it back to the officials and he got like nominal amount back in our second, like officially unofficial currency, which was called bonds. You know, uh, it, it like lived besides uh, the Czechoslovakia Corona. And the, as this uh, second currency wasn't actually officially accepted in any store back then, which basically wasn't a problem because they were either empty, all of them. It was like even like a standard uh, basic goods in the store. So the only place to go and spend that second currency was special stores. They were few of them in Czechoslovakia back then, and they were called Tuzex. Um, maybe I shall Google what, what, the, what, the, what does it mean. And that was a special store where Western goods was available. You know, you can imagine like uh, electronics, even jeans, some kind of like luxury items, not available in the regular shops, you know, but uh, as the goods there was only available for those like unofficial second currency called bonds, and you were, and, and anyone wasn't allowed to spend the official Czechoslovakia Corona. It was like prominent store, you know, which is quite, quite absurd because communists were telling us, hey, our party will take care of everything. We will take care of your, of your wealth. Everybody will have the same stuff on one hand. And on the other hand, they officially opened two Zek stores where prominent could buy like capitalist good from the West, you know? So like communism and, and the greatest of it. And uh, I believe that maybe even you, or I hope you or the other Bitcoiners heard of peer-to-peer uh, -peer Bitcoin trading marketplace created by Satoshi Labs, its application called, called Vexel. Yeah. And that name in Vexel actually uh, originates from the dark age of the communist. And uh, it, it reminds us of the guys who were called Vexlags, like traders, who were usually standing around the, those Tuzek stores and doing that dark market uh, trading of that bonds, our Czechoslovakia Koruna and foreign currencies like dollars, German marks, Austrian shillings, and uh, Italian liras and stuff like this. And vice versa, you know, they basically had a price or offer for both sides of the trade. So if someone was for some reason in possession of dollars, they were definitely totally useless here in Czech Republic. And it was actually uh, illegal. So people having a dollars or marks or whatever could end up in a prison, basically. So they usually reached those vex slacks standing next to the two uh, Western stores and bought a bonds, those second currency, like papers and coins for those second currencies. So they can go and visit the store and buy some Western goods, you know? And... Uh, it's actually weird because it was completely Ill illegal, but it was like uh, kind of like officially tolerated, you know, like the officials just closed their eyes when they saw the vex slacks on the street. And it was actually, and I realized that like uh, years, years after that, it was not a coincidence. And there's like funny example that when uh, Velvet Revolution happened in 1989, it, it was a situation which actually came a few weeks after the Berlin Wall went down, our official Czech Republic National Bank was established. And the National Bank was curious how much Czech Kurunas they, sh they shall pay for dollars or for marks or for shillings or for any, any, any other currency, but they had no idea because there was no history of the, of the uh, exchange rate. 
So the officials from the National Bank went to streets, found those VEX slugs, and asked them, hey, guys, how much shall we give like the, our, our uh, habitants for every dollar or for marks? And basically, those VEX slugs set our first national official exchange rate for any foreign currencies on top of our Czech National Bank, you know, Czechoslovakia National Bank. So uh, there, this is, you know, like totally absurd, you know, just that's uh, amazing. That's yeah, that that's the plebs, right? That's, that's the, the plebs. plebs. Yeah, that's the yeah. plebs now. So you can imagine like a national bank now coming to the plebs and saying, yeah, you Bitcoin dudes, like, where should we actually <laughs> set the price for, for our, uh, you know, our local fiat shitcoin uh, as you know, we we go through this transition. Mate, I had no idea about um, why it was called Vexilent. And funnily enough, I've got a an interview lined up with Grafton tomorrow. Who's oh, he's to, great. He's yeah, great. He's, he's going to really uh, delve into all of that as well. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. And for those people that don't know, it's an app you can download and find peer-to-peer um, trades and, and you go and meet them uh, in person and um and make those trades and i know it's i've seen it in action in uh in prague i've not had the chance to play around with it myself yet but uh hopefully next time we're there in prague for btc prague hopefully in june we'll be there <laughs> i'm going to be able to find some plebs on there and um it should be very easy you know in a conference uh, yeah but, there's uh, going to be plenty of like slacks running the btc prague conference but uh if grafton is joining your show tomorrow or maybe i leave this on him uh <laughs> he, he can tell tell much more you know but so i've got a few yeah. uh, a few questions about yeah uh, sure sure about the history because so you're it's funny right you're born in 1984 of all the years yes. uh so uh very very orwellian of you and um you uh you would have been what about five then when the revolution happened in 1989 so you probably don't remember too much of that other than, well, did did you have television channels? Was that was this something that was being like uh, broadcast? Like, what what do you remember your parents talking about at that time? Like, you know, what what was the feel? Yeah, I don't remember a lot in prison, to be honest. And it goes even with the fact that we used to live in Moscow back then. Wow. So living in a Moscow. So I, I believe that the like Russian media weren't really happy about uh, the Czech Revolution here yeah. and, and seeing the fact that we are trying to get rid of them. Uh, and my parents were definitely scared. So I remember that they called uh, to Czech Republic very often, you know, they, they sent letters. We still had to remember that that was the analog era back then, mm-hmm. like no cell phones. Uh, we went to the phone booth to street to, to give them the, the call to our re- relatives. So uh, it was and quite what, weird. Why were you in Moscow? What was your father's work? Yeah, my father, he followed my grandfather, grandfather's steps. So he was he worked like for academics and he worked on some uh, stainless steel I- improvement uh, design with a Russian uh, iron mill factory there. And we basically moved to Finland after the Velvet Revolution so he can continue with his work. And he did his diploma there and, uh, and a PhD. Uh, so he was academic basically right? he's is that cool right okay so <laughs> what yeah it's such a, a weird moment in history and i was actually going to bring up this point because germany uh invaded um so world war ii you get you'd get taught about this right that this is what i was not taught about when i was going through my state indoctrination because uh, of course our state indoctrination in the uh, the UK system is, um, you know, Germany bad, England good, yay, we won the both world wars. Like it, it, that's about <laughs> that's what it amounts to. Um, now I read uh, the book The Tower of Basel, and it's an incredible read. If anybody's not read that one yet, um, it really does get into the weeds of the Bank of International Settlements and how that was set up. But the, the the story in there about when Germany invaded Czechoslovakia, and of course, was the first thing any country does is go to the uh, go to the bank, right? They want the gold. Uh, now, from memory, what happened was they go to the gold, uh, they go to the bank to find out where the gold is, so that they can steal the gold. 
and uh, finance the war machine. But the gold had been placed under the guard of the Bank of England. So the account was held at the Bank of England. But at gunpoint, the, the, the manager of the bank called the Bank of England to have the, all of the gold reserves of uh, Czechoslovakia transferred to the Third Reich's account in the Bank of International Settlements in Switzerland. Neutral okay. in air quotes, right? Mm -hmm. Now, that, <laughs> that got green flagged. And that got green flagged by Montague Norman, who was head of the Bank of England, who also just happened to be co-founder of the Bank of International Settlements with Helmut Schacht, who was in Germany, a German guy. So they allowed the transfer of all of the, Czechos the Czechoslovakian gold to the Third Reich's bank account under the Bank of International Settlements. We don't get told that in England. Like our head of the Bank of England basically helped finance the war machine of the Third Reich, which then would have used that to build munitions to rain down on London. Like, this is complete and utter fucking... Out it's an outrage on every yeah. sense. Uh, it's, mate, so there's so much here that... Um, did you know of that history? Had you heard that story or read that story before? No, 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 I'm, I'm actually... I'm not really, I haven't heard, but I'm not really surprised, to be honest, you know, uh, just great example of uh, not a single logic in it, you know, uh, it, it's, it's money driven, right? It's fiat driven. Mm. So it's, uh, we have many, many other examples of like uh, such a, sorry for, for such a bullshit, you know. Yeah, exactly. it's not about the humanity, not about the country, not about anything. Yeah, it's just about supporting the fiat animal, eh? feeding it. So when did you get back to uh, the Czech Republic then? Be and when did it come, the Czech Republic? Hang on, I've got my dates here. Yeah, what's the... Yeah, when did that happen? What do you, what do you mean? The Velvet Revolution or...? No, um, so you were Czechoslovakia, but then you became... Yes. The, right, now yeah, you we become... have separated in 1993. Right. Yeah, and that, that goes mostly after Slovakians as uh, their country felt like being too much involved by our Czech politics. And, you know, they are actually far away from Prague. So they thought that actually Slovaks should decide what's good for Slovaks in Slovakia, not in Prague. And it was like peaceful separation, I would say, you know. And Czechs love Slovaks, and uh, I hope that it works even vice versa. They are like our brothers. We can understand uh, our languages fluently, so uh, that's it. Yeah. So that happened in 1993, peaculy, luckily. Right, okay. yeah. and when, when did you return then to um, to Prague? Yes, yeah, so we, went, we returned soon after the revolution, actually, to Prague. We stayed here uh, for one and a half year and moved to Finland for almost six years, actually. Wow, man. So you've been all over the place. <laughs> yeah, a few places I visited already as a kid. Yes, yes. I traveled. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So then I, I guess at some point, you, you growing up, you're a young man, Bitcoin enters your life for some reason. Well, what was that? Actually, uh, uh, it's... I hope the story is like um, more more like interesting, but it's quite common, I would say, you know, it, uh, and it follows like uh, the story of many others that uh, I was introduced into Bitcoin in 2017. Just few friends told me about it during a week, just out of nothing, basically. And when I was back at home talking with my wife, uh, she just said, hey, I've heard about something like Bitcoin today. You've heard of it? And I said, okay, so that, that's interesting. It's probably really happening something around here. We shall explore. So we did some basic research and realized that it's like worth of maybe spending some money on it. So we bought some small portion. And it, it, is, it is always as, as soon as you put some money into something, it drives your attention, you know? So uh, I've studied more and I explored, I bought, I did a lot of shit coining because I was finding what's the better Bitcoin, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and I had to lose some of money to learn the lesson. And I've, I hope I've learned. So soon, soon in like nine, 
2019, I realized that, okay, there's, there's no better Bitcoin. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. You know, you cannot copy it, right? So I was thinking even with my mother, you know, what, what shall or can we do in the space? Just accept holding, you know? And uh, as we are not like developers or technically focused guys, uh, and we were always like fans of uh, getting people together and organizing parties and having fun and having our rela rela relatives closer. So we fought for ourselves. So what about we do like bit? What about we do like a Bitcoin conference? So I did some research, and as I worked in e-commerce for um, many years. As business development manager and project manager, I visited like many differently focused events here in Czechia and in Europe. So I knew something how like probably small events should be managed and organized. And uh, so we did research and we realized that basically there is no like proper Bitcoin conference in Czech Republic. There were like few others differently focused, more like cypherpunk style and stuff like this. So we said, okay, let's let's give it a try. Let's organize a Bitcoin conference. So we created brand Chain Camp. That's our second conference. It, it happens in Ostrava, but to, it, that gets us to the year of 2020. But then COVID appeared, you know, and it was like really crazy. Our governments uh, they were acting like a like really like it was a nonsense. Basically, they came up with the saying that hey, every event or public gathering for more than 500 percent is forbid with the validity of today's midnight. And I said, uh, come on, <laughs> it, it takes us like two days to organize it at the place and everything. But we, we gave it a try and it we've informed everyone, hey, that the worst case is that can happen is that we will just ping you that uh, maybe we are not able to make it happen. But we were super lucky actually that because we picked a date uh, for the first year of, of the chain camp when the restrictions were down for a week for some reason, you know, this government said, hey, no restrictions for this week, enjoy guys. And our, our conference fit into it. So we got like huge traction because we were basically the only ones who were organizing anything. So we've attracted 450 visitors, realized that it's actually a lot of fun, you know, and that we like it, that we can learn a lot, that we can meet a lot of interesting people, uh, realize what's noise and what's like the signal. So we thought that, okay, let's repeat. So we repeat it year after 2021. Again, we picked a date when the restrictions were down because that was still uh, the COVID back then. Doubled the number. So we've reached 1,000 visitors and check only Bitcoin only conference. You know, so we still need to consider it in Czech Republic with 10 million inhabitants only. Doubled the number again year after in 2022 and somebody actually told us that we are the biggest non-english speaking conference in the world and we said I've, like what really we haven't thought about it in this way and we it, it got it like penetrated the bitcoin space here in czech republic and even abroad and so we got some um requires from foreign speakers and foreign partners that they somehow want to be part of it you know come to speak and come to or, or come to present what they work on and stuff like this. So we thought how we can actually merge it together. But that would, you know, that would require us to move from Ostrava to Prague, switch from Czech to English, at least maybe on, on, on stage. And we realized that that would ruin the brand of Chain Camp, of our local conference. It is, it is like really plat focus, orange, orange pilling focused. So we said, hey, let's just um, let's create another event like uh, English first, international one in Prague. So what the goals should be. And uh, as we are, as we are like, we like challenges with Matthias. We said, like, we have basically only one shot to be the biggest in the Europe. So let's be biggest in the Europe. You know, let's attract 10,000 visitors and 100 companies. And we said, is it doable? You know, it was the year of bear market and but we said, hey, everybody is in bear market. So uh, it's not about the market situation. It's a, we have all the same conditions, right? So, so we give it a try, basically. And, uh, and here we are, you know. I, of course, of course fair, fair is to say that we, had, we received like great support from Satoshi Labs, from Stick and Slash. And they are like the OGs of OGs. They have their, uh, they, they like in basically every Bitcoin door, you know. And they were willing us to open doors for us. So, and they stand up for us, gave us the trust. 
Because it, it was funny, you know, we went to uh, Pacific Bitcoin in LA with Matthias in 2022. And we were just two random guys running the venue with our crazy story of creating like the biggest Bitcoin conference in the world for the first shot. And I remember the faces. Yeah, it was like, yeah, guys, sure. Cross fingers, you know. <laughs> And uh, it turned out to be a good idea because uh, it, it mostly went well. It, it wasn't actually easy, yeah, but uh, it was a success. So, but I'm not the right one to say it. It was a, from our perspective, it was great. And, and I love the feedback, but I don't know if I have answered your question, if this was, but I basically covered the Bitcoin story of mine yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, what a rabbit hole story. Uh, and so you said before you were just working in e-commerce that you, you'd kind of left college and just found a job working in e-commerce. That was what, what was, yeah, I, I, I was always like a curious guy. So, and I was always curious about the IT. So already on the secondary school, I tested hardware, GPUs, CPUs, motherboards, monitors, and uh, LC, LCDs and stuff like this wrote articles, explored, then I switched, I did some IT support stuff. Then I had like my small company taking care of IT service. Then I went uh, and applied for the e-commerce, learned what project management is. Then I jumped into the business development, learned what sales is about. And uh, I would say that I'm a fast learner and I get bored of like uh, stereotypic stuff. So I, as soon as I get bored, I always come come up with some another creative crazy idea what I can do and work to so uh, I like to switch and learn basically yeah. what what were the official numbers through the door for BTC Prague last year yeah six and a half thousand visitors in three days unique visitors wow that's awesome and what do you think I mean are you getting any inkling as, as to how many people are going to come this year or ticket sales <laughs> about to take off like, you, you can never tell right yeah, you can never tell as uh, this is actually quite interesting that COVID changed the way how people buy tickets, like completely, basically. Uh, as before the COVID, people were usually used to buy the early bird, early bird waves, you know, uh, and it goes with uh, music festivals, uh, music parties, conferences, uh, not only Bitcoin ones, but in general. And uh, for some reason, and, and I actually think that it's because people are still scared of the COVID, you know, uh, or not about the COVID itself, but uh, about the government approach. Um, they buy for the very last moment, I would hmm. say. Yeah, the majority of the tickets are being sold during the last two months. And the second thing is that, you know, when we see Bitcoin being in the bull run, uh, almost hitting new ATH every day, and uh, so I believe the, the, the visitors are speculating because price of Bitcoin grows much faster than we are making our tickets more expensive. So it's actually a good idea to save Bitcoin and, and buy later. But it, it it's a bit stressy for me, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, you know, accept it, they will come. Build it, they will come. Uh, there, there's no doubt in my mind that you're going to get at the minimum, the same kind of numbers as you did last year. Um, but if you follow the trend that you followed with your other events, I mean, c could you imagine doubling like it really? Uh, yeah, I, I can actually not, not for this year. Our goal is to attract uh, eight and a half thousand visitors. That is, uh, I believe the maximum that the venue can hold still being sure that everybody will feel somehow comfortable there, you know? I don't want to make it like really super crowded and sweaty, you know, but um, we are already thinking about 2025 and we can really go crazy in the same venue. We can hire more, more uh, halls, which mm -hmm. follows there and we can go up to 30,000 or 25,000. Yeah. Maybe having 20, 25,000 visitors in a year of 2025 would be nice. Yeah. Wow, man. That's huge. <laughs> But so, it depends on the market situation the most, you know, it, still the Bitcoin price is the most uh, effective factor. And you had the best beer in all Bitcoin conferences. <laughs> I, I would say, yes, yes. It's it's the <laughs> it's best, <true>. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, if anybody if is are... listening and they want to get out there, um, the uh, it's just available on the website and they can use the code BITTEN and they'll get 10% off of that purchase. Um, yeah, and it's, it's such a great event. And have you got any... Um, 
different plans this year special announcements or are you keeping things pretty <laughs> tight i know you're announcing something every day at the moment but uh what um yeah what what are you able to share yeah okay i i will start like a low profile so basically um we were, we are going to copy paste the format of the last year as the as it turned out to be like the great idea how we divided the venue into two main sections like the main stage and the expo section connected with the with the main hall uh it allowed people to orient orient there easily and that outside section with the food tracks chill zone uh, beers beer points uh and and fun stuff I, I believe that that worked well so this year we're gonna copy paste and but tune and polish everything up so there were like a lot of things that uh um, might be better so we're gonna improve them this year and uh the major difference and the change is that um we are going to have an after party on the conference every single day because you know from the feedback we realized that people got lost while traveling to the city center and basically all the bitcoiners want to stay together even after the conference network talk about bitcoin or anything else but you know that, that, that's wonderful and that's what i like on the bitcoin the most actually the people you know because if you meet bitcoiner from anywhere actually all around the world you can probably be sure that you share at least some same some, some same life values you know so it's easy to end up with like nice conversation and there's always a bitcoin you can talk about so we want to allow to all the people to stay there, have fun. We're gonna open like another bar, put some DJs on the stage and make it like enjoyable every single day. And there are like some uh, other small things which gonna improve the like overall quality of the event and of the enjoyability of it a lot. So for example, uh, in the expo section, there's gonna be like a big booth of 21 world communities like the gathering point where Ainun Svansig or our local Jedna Dvacet or uh, Ventuno from Italy can actually, those those plebs can meet there and talk and share uh, what are the cultural differences in their countries. And I believe that that will help us to uh, work for our mission as we are trying to build the Bitcoin bridges across the Europe, allow the plebs and everyone grow grow faster together. Yeah, that's such a huge point because I don't know about you, but like, um, I remember 2016, 17, 18, 19, sitting there just watching everything explode in the US or North America, you know, US and Canada, and thinking, we are so far behind what's going on over there. All of the innovation, all of the conversations seem to be coming from, from over there. Mm, Even yeah, all of right. the podcast guests uh, would always be, you know, from, from that part of the world. And that, I feel, has shifted, like, huge it almost inverted because the the work going on not just in europe uh but across you know like uh australia now um the our aussie brothers they've just thrown their second uh event uh bitcoin alive in sydney and they have the um the bush bash run by uh wizard of Oz and uh, i think uh, old uncle bill um the, 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 the initiatives that are going on around the world and obviously what's going on in El Salvador, Guatemala, Paraguay, you know, all of these places, Roatan, Dushan doing great work over there. Yeah. It's just incredible. And But the, the idea that when you look at Europe, it's such this melting pot of different cultures, different languages and different approaches uh, to Bitcoin, but with all the same goal. And you look at a city like Arnhem, I had Patrick on from uh, Arnhem, Bitcoinstad. 10 years ago, they've been, they've been doing this for 10 years. That knowledge needs unlocking and, and mm. bringing them across to, to Prague to meet the Islands of Unsvig, you know, they've done incredible work. Meet what you guys are doing in Prague and but name the companies that are in Prague, like Satoshi Labs. Uh, get, you go for it. Like there's so many. Yeah, yeah, I actually completely follow on this. Yeah, it, we do not need to reinvent the wheel again and again. You know, we just need to bring the people together. And I understand that it's not easy in the Europe because of uh, so many small countries, different languages, different cultural history, even different use cases for Bitcoin. You know, uh, the people are approaching Bitcoin with different needs and and from different perspectives. You know, I believe that they end up understanding that the use cases are more like same. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad that it happens in Prague because, you know, Prague 
and I believe that it has established itself as the Bitcoin capital of the world, you know, and um, I've already explained the history. So I would more like say that it's uh, not a coincidence. It's more like a natural escalation of uh, our freedom finding. And because of the communism era and those uh, Tuzak stores and the lack of basic, basic goods in the stores, we just had to be creative as a Czechs. So that created that culture of like craftsmanship in our country. Um, people had to build everything by themselves, you know, like furniture, sport equipment, electronics, because it was simply in the need, right? But uh, to answer your questions, yes, it, the craftsmanship brought people and creative minds together already in 2009 in the, uh, in the hackerspace in Prague. And a uh, few people met there reaching and seeing that there's something like a geeky around Bitcoin happening, you know, and they actually created most of the tools, not in the intents of providing them to the Bitcoin market. They were first trying to solve their own problems, you know, they had in, with Bitcoin. So for example, Slash from uh, Satoshi Labs created Slash Pool already in 2010. That was like the first Bitcoin mining pool ever, ever announced. And it already mined more than 1 million Bitcoin. Probably not a single pool will, will reach such a number then. Again, like the two years after, uh, Slash and Stick from Satoshi Labs created first ever hardware wallet because they thought that uh, storing like Bitcoin addresses on the paper is, is not safe enough, you know, or storing them in like uh, in, in the online application. And one year after, again, Slash and Stick, they created Web39 standard in Prague. Whole seed phrase stuff, it origin from Prague, basically, you know. Uh, in the same year, General Bytes uh, created first ever Bitcoin ATM, and they are the biggest uh, manufacturer of, of them uh, in the world. And last but not least, you know, Brains Mining Company and their uh, custom ASIC mining firmware, which you can auto-tune the chips so they... Um, they can produce like a higher higher hash rate and they care and run the slush pool, brains pool now. Again, it's it's Prague, you know, and they have their headquarters there or uh, maybe Paralenipolis. That's like a hackerspace which works and operates in Prague already for 10 years. Uh, and they never, never accepted uh, payments in fiat. They, were, they are driven and run on crypto only since 2014, yeah? And uh, I don't know what else to say, you know, it, it's just uh, so those companies and people who work for Bitcoin, you know, they said like such a strong uh, ground for Bitcoin success. And then it's, uh, I don't want to like, uh, maybe I don't know, I'm going to send it from different perspective that building on such a strong ground it, it, and knowing about snowballing effect, you know, so those, when those companies grow, they hire more people and they share the message of the Bitcoin. And uh, again, we've, okay, because of our history, we always loved like the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, changing and buying not only Bitcoin, but everything. Uh, we like non-KYC approach because government cannot take our, our property out of us. And just uh, it escalated so quickly that, you know, now in the Czech Republic, in the country of 10 million inhabitants, we have... 300,000 Bitcoiners, that's like the best estimation, like 3% of the population is orange pilled here. And I, I then I, I'm not talking about the crypto guys, you know, so considering even this would maybe get us to the higher numbers, you know, so um, and then, I'm proud then, that I can, I can continue with this uh, in Prague, with BTC Prague, actually, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And, and don't you have like the, the biggest um, in-store merchant that accepts Bitcoin? I never remember. Is it like a supermarket yeah. chain or something? Or... Yeah, it's like our biggest e-commerce store called Alza. And uh -huh. you can buy anything except groceries there for Bitcoin. Right. Even a Tesla, actually. Yeah. And you can get all those stuff delivered into, how is it called? Like a po postal box. And they are all around the Czech Republic, outside on the streets. And they don't ask for your name or for any details. They only ask for phone numbers so they can deliver you an SMS uh, with the code to open the open the locker, you know, and you can buy like an anonymous SIM card. So you can really spend Bitcoin for anything here in Czech Republic, still not like uh, spoiling your personal data, which is which is like great. Yeah.
Has the event, did that attract any uh, officials and air quotes, politicians? Uh, is anyone reaching out that interested to come and learn? Or are you still like at the, at that stage where they're, they're, they're still fighting it? Uh, what, what's the feel? Yes, so far, uh, it was like mostly that uh, they don't care. Need, neither neither the side, you know, and uh, they are they were not no fighting, no supporting it, just not giving a shit basically, uh, which is good because there is no like a proper uh, understanding of the regulation. The regulation is not ready for crypto in general, and but it's it's I would say like changing slowly, and it looks like that government is already like talking about the Bitcoin and supporting it. Maybe even like um, officially uh, approving the time test, like in Germany. So if you are in possession of crypto for more than three years, it, it's considered to be like a bond or a stock, and you do not need to pay any tax from from the income of it. If you hold it for more than, and that's the question: if it will will be like one, two, or three years. But it's like somehow happening already especially here in Czech Republic in the positive way, I would say, on one hand. But on the other hand, we are seeing that European Union is coming with uh, the regulation of uh, forbidding any uh, custody wallets, you know, that you ha basically have to go through the AML process uh, if you want to store anything on, uh, on your wallet anywhere, which is really funny because that's just another proof how detached they are from the reality. They understand nothing, you know. It's, it's it's really crazy. I love that. Yeah. What did I call it? An unhosted wallet, right? That that's yeah. the language that they've settled on. It's like, yeah. oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> but we we are we are we are fine. We've already lost of lot lost all of our bitcoins in the boating accident, right? So we do yeah. not need to bother. But I'm I'm yeah I'm sad for all the people who who did not yet. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, mate. Oh well, I think we've covered most things uh was there anything else that you wanted to cover or touch on before i ask you the last question <laughs> uh yeah uh, i just want to like uh invite everyone to come to btc prague because that even this uh unprecedented i would say and it happens in the middle of the europe it it won't be easier to travel to such a scale conference and we are really care and we really curate every single speaker, every single partner, and we try to separate noise from the signal. So if anyone considers Bitcoin being like interesting topic or is already in Bitcoin and want to learn more and meet people, just come to the conference because it's like mostly now in AI era, you know, we probably won't be able to recognize what's true and what's not in the online space in upcoming years. But meeting people face to face is, uh, something which will still have or even have like the higher value in the future. And uh, it's like going to the music festival or to the concert. If you are a fan of Pink Floyd, of course, you can put the LP on and listen with your high quality headphones. But feeling that energy of people around enjoying the same vibe, it's like unprecedented. So uh, just come to BTC Prague. Yeah. <laughs> it's so true. And um, if, if you can't make it, just at least get to a local event just even if that's yeah. a two-hour drive get to an event get in front of people because it's so important to feel that and i've met so many bitcoiners some have been in bitcoin of like five to ten years never been to a conference never been to a meetup never actually met uh they might have met bitcoiners in person like one-on-one -on -one, and that's always great but when when there's like minimum 10 of you it's like it, there's something else like you, the, the energy like the frequency um the vibe if you want to go all woo woo it's different it is it's so different and it's uh tangible and you you get thousands of people in a room together uh i saw some um yeah incredible formations uh transformations excuse me last year at btc prague where a few newbies that had come along with some friends from the uk just having their minds blown time and time again and by the time <laughs> he kept sending voice messages to his son who was living in Canada, he's like, we've got to start buying some Bitcoin. <laughs> he's like getting messages back. He's like, dad, you're going a bit crazy. Like, but it was just incredible, <laughs> incredible yeah. to see. Then he started buying all of the books and uh, I hope he comes back uh, again this year and um, brings a friend with him. 
uh, one pleb at a time, right? This is all it takes. And uh, these events yeah, and are put on for a reason, and we may as well be going to them and attending them and supporting them. And yes, the, the, there's a there's an outlay of cost. There is an outlay of cost in euros, pounds, dollars, whatever it is. And there is an outlay of cost in time as well. But the opportunities that come, like the the you have no idea where this could lead. And there are so many stories like Nathan, Nathan Day, who founded BTC Maps. He freaking decided to do that while sitting in the front row of the Riga conference at the Baltic Honey Badger. Like, you know, too many things going off his mind. Right, I need to do something. I'd found a group <laughs> of guys and started BTC Map within a few weeks. <laughs> yeah. But this is what happens. And this is what I want more and more plebs to understand that like once you get there and you find the people, you'll connect with everyone on a certain level, but then there'll be a few others that are just like, no, we have to do this. Like this idea we just discussed over a beer around surrounded by like-minded people, this now has to happen. And that could be any kind of project. Yeah. And it, I completely agree. Yeah, like Satoshi Labs, Treasure, Slashpool, it won't happen if those guys won't get together and think and meet and brainstorm, you know? And now we are, when we are heading to another bull run, okay, it's, it's great for Bitcoin, but and I can already see it, there are so many scammy projects popping out like mushrooms, actually. And being on the yeah. event allows you to like easily rec like consider what's valid and what's not. And there are tons of people who can tell you the truth. You know, they probably won't tell it online on the Twitter because somebody can grab them and nobody wants to end up with problems. But going to the conference. And okay, definitely, it's not only about the BTC Prague. You can do the same uh, with the small meetup, and please do so. I completely follow. It's a great way how to give people like the real reasons why to do Bitcoin, why not to shitcoin. That there's then no free money. You know, nobody will just give you airdrop and stuff like this. And it helps you understand that if you are not paying for the product, you are the product again, right? We, we've talked about it, so. Yeah, events are best, definitely. Right, Martin. If you had one last orange pill left to give to somebody, who would you give it to and why? Ha! <laughs> oh wow. Tough one, man. Orange okay, I have one pill and I have to give it to someone. Uh yeah, I, I will probably target high, you know, maybe really going to to some government guy. I do not need to go into names now, but I, yeah, that's, that's probably it, you know, uh, as bottom up approach it is here in Czech Republic goes pretty well, but we need the regulators to understand that, hey guys, there's something like really, really happening and we, we as a Czech Republic can benefit on it. Oh man, so much. So yeah, I will target high. Maybe our president, I would, I would, I would orange pill our president. He's a cool guy, by the way, finally, after many, many years. And having him in Bitcoin would uh, help us to like stand out of, of the crowd and make Czech Republic uh, great again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Let's get him along. Let's get him along and listening to some of the panels. That would be, uh, that'd be the best way we can do that. Yeah, we can even ask Samson. Maybe he can help us. Yeah. With this. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get Samson and Philip to give him a ring and like, yeah, you, know, <laughs> you want to come along and, and uh, get, in, get in front of some of the plebs? All right, mate. Well, what's the best way to, to find you and to learn more about BTC Prague? Yeah, like uh, Twitter. I believe that uh, for some reason, Bitcoiners have uh, took over that medium, which is great. So we are definitely on the Twitter, BTC Prague handle. And uh, it's not hard to find even my handle there. Uh, it used to so be. Feel f I'm sorry. It, it used, it to, used be to be hard to find you. <laughs> you're right, you're right. That was my old nickname from World of Warcraft days. <laughs> <laughs> so I realized that, okay, it's not a good idea to keep it for now. But yes, so that, that's, the way, that's the best way. Or you, anyone can actually reach, reach us on hello.bdcprog.com. We answer every single email. So I'm more than happy to answer all the questions. Just do not hesitate, guys. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Well, thanks for coming on, mate. Thanks for everything that you're doing. And I look forward to seeing both of you guys. Fingers crossed. Both of you guys will get over and uh, we'll hang out in Prague. Yeah. Thank you very much, Daniel, for the invitation. And I hope you're going to make it too with, with Laura. 
we'll see you soon mate take yeah. care thank you take care